welcome to What Your GP Doesn't Tell You, the podcast for both doctors and patients with me, Liz Tucker. This week, I'm talking to consultant colorectal surgeon, Mr. James Kinross, about the huge impact that our biomes have on every aspect of our health. In his new book, Dark Matter, The New Science of the Microbiome, James argues that the biome may hold the key to understanding diseases as varied as Alzheimer's, cancer, bowel, and autoimmune illnesses, and that the rise of these conditions may be at least partially due to the disruption that's been caused to our biomes by the food we eat, antibiotics, and even the environment around us. Astonishingly, James reveals that the way a man and woman's biome interacts may even have an impact on their ability to reproduce. And I discover why having my appendix out when I was 13 may have been a mixed blessing. But before we get to the interview with James, a brief request from me. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to find out more, you can sign up to my Substack account, which is liztucker.substack.com. Go to my podcast website at whatyourgpdoesnttellyou.com and follow me on Twitter at Liz C. Tucker. And if you'd like to financially support the podcast, I'd really appreciate it. A huge amount of work goes into both the research and production of this. So even a small amount of money makes a huge difference. And you can provide support at patreon.com, what your GP doesn't tell you, or via my website, which as I mentioned is what your GP doesn't tell you dot com. Many thanks. And now back to James's interview. James Ken Ross is a senior lecturer in colorectal surgery and a surgeon at Imperial College London. He leads a research team exploring how the microbiome may drive cancer and other diseases of the gut. Here's James's interview. So James, thanks so much for joining the podcast today. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. James, you've likened the microbes in our bodies to a sort of biological dark matter because we only have a very superficial knowledge of how they work. I have, yes. And I appreciate that will be quite a controversial concept to some. But what I've said in this book is that we are actually populated by an enormous density of microscopic organisms about which we know very little. And the book is called Dark Matter for that purpose. When we think about the biome, I think people tend to think about the gut biome. But you make the point that we have different biomes in different parts of our body and our mouths, our noses, our genitals. Yeah. I think gut health as a theme has become really very popular. I think the lay public are now very attuned to the idea that the gut is an organ which has important systemic functions. And of course, our largest population of of microbes reside within the gut. And the scale of the microbiome there is kind of mind-boggling. It's about 100 trillion microscopic organisms. It's a genome that dwarfs the human genome in terms of scale. We probably have around 23,000 functions within the human genome that code proteins, although it's obviously larger than that. But there's probably hundreds of millions of microbial genes within within our gut. The microbiome is not gut-centric. You have a very important skin microbiome. You have a very important lung microbiome. We have a urogenital microbiome. And these things govern our health and our happiness in important ways. And the key issue that I'm really trying to get across in this book is that they're all interconnected. So if you disrupt the microbiome in one field, it's going to have an implication in the other. And James, in terms of interconnection, as someone who had their appendix removed many years ago when I was 13 and told it played no part in my health, I was interested to read that it seems there actually may be a connection between not having an appendix and inflammatory bowel disease, colostrum difficile infections, colorectal cancer, and even irritable bowel syndrome. And that may be because of its role in the gut biome. Yeah. And of course, there's always an important distinction between association and causation. But just to take a step back, there's this Darwinian theory that the appendix is really an evolutionary footnote. was important at some point when we had a predominantly vegetarian diet, and then at some point it died out. And that's just not true. The microbiome within the appendix is discrete and important. So actually, it's not so simple that the appendix or appendicectomy increases risk, it can actually decrease risk in some particular conditions. And in fact, actually, it can be a form of therapy. So we've got a, several large trials now that are about to report looking at prophylactic appendicectomy in the treatment of ulcerative colitis. So it might be that if you remove the appendix, actually, it has therapeutic benefit if you've already got an established immune condition of the gut. I think of the appendix now, really, as an immune organ in its own right. 
And when I take a history now for something like irritable bowel syndrome, I always ask about appendicectomy. And actually, it's the relationship between the dense populations of immune cells of the innate immune system that reside and live within the appendix and the small bowel mesentery within the terminal ileum and the microbes that live there. That's the key. So, yeah, it's much more important than we think or appreciate. I now tell all of my surgical trainees, if the appendix looks normal, keep it there. Your patients need it. Don't remove it. So, James, for some people, having their appendix removed may be beneficial, but for others, it may not be. So the key factor here yep. is the issue of time. So it's when this happens and at what particular mode in your development it happens. So if you're an adult and you're in your, your middle age and you have an appendicectomy, well, the implications are very, very different than when you're in early life. This is a core concept of microbiome science, which I think is really important to understand, which is that the microbiome is not constant. It evolves and develops with us as we age. Now, what we think is the assembly in the gut, particularly of the gut microbiome in very, very early life, is a defining moment in determining how our immune system is going to develop and how it's going to then be able to maintain resilience in the face of a dynamic and evolving uh, modern environment. And therefore, if you perturb the gut microbiome at that critical phase, the implications may be quite significant and are definitely not well understood. Now, I mentioned at the beginning cause and effect, this idea that, okay, you've, you've, you've removed the appendix, but is there something else going on? Well, it might equally be that those patients who are having appendicectomy are getting a lot more antibiotics. And it might be that actually it's only a small number of doses of antibiotics at those critical moments in your gut development that have the impact. And what we know is that the individual response to all medicines, and, and anybody working in primary healthcare will know this, we know that the variability in individuals' response to a drug or treatment is very large. And antibiotics have a very variable response on, on an individual. And we know that there are some people that seem to have this phenomenon of microbiome scarring. So it's not just that the numbers of bacteria drop dramatically by 30 to 40,000 fold. It's that the diversity changes, the function of the microbiome changes, and in some people it never comes back. So unpicking this story of appendicectomy is kind of hard. There are lots of confounding variables within that story. And for me in my research, we are now increasingly interested in the use of antibiotics in early life and the long-term implications of that for chronic diseases and non-communicable disease. And I suppose it's possible that if you have inflammatory bowel disease, you may be more likely to have problems with your appendix. Your appendix is removed you then develop inflammatory bowel disease in later life. So as you say, association is not causation. Correct. I see this in a lot of my patients with chronic functional gut problems. So chronic constipation, chronic sensitized guts, hypersensitivity, you know, within the IBS kind of portfolio. And a lot of these poor people have their appendix incorrectly taken out because they turn up in A&E with abdominal pain. And, you know, someone perhaps not unreasonably says, we're going to do a laparoscopy and fish out your appendix because we think that might be the cause. And of course, it's not the cause. So this all feeds into this theme of precision precision health, precision diagnostics, and it's why the microbiome is so important, because unless you understand the biological variation that the microbiome causes in our risk of disease and our response to disease and our response to disease therapy, you can't have that precise measure. So for somebody like me that had my appendix removed when I was 13, yeah. that may well have had some long-term impact on my gut biome. I think I would say, yes, it might well have done. I think 13 is a super interesting age because without to dive too much into your own personal medical <laughs> history, you're kind of around the time of puberty, right? Yeah. So we know that disrupting the microbiome before puberty has quite a big impact uh, on its development later. Now, you argue that the rise that we're seeing in autism, allergies, autoimmune disease is at least partially due to the disruption that's been caused to our biome, both by the food we eat and external factors such as chemicals in the environment. What's the evidence for that? So I suppose what I'm trying to say in this book is that I think as clinicians, quite often we work in silos. I'm a cancer doctor, so I spend all my time trying to work out why bowel cancer incidence is rising in young people. And what I'm arguing is, is that actually you have to look across the broader epidemiological field. And when you do that, you start to see a well-documented and well-described rise in 
immune mediated conditions like asthma allergy uh, you know we know that 300 million people across the world now have asthma we know that by 2025 half of the european population will have an allergy of some form half half wow like it's crazily a large number we know that rheumatoid arthritis risk is rising by 7% per year these patterns are well documented globally and we know that western societies or, or urbanized societies are at higher risk and what we know from these epidemiological studies is that there are a lot of environmental drivers that seem to have an association but have been causally linked. What I'm saying is that the microbiome is so critical because it serves as an intermediary between those environmental drivers and our immune systems. And it's a critical component of the development of our immune systems, but it also regulates the response of our immune system to those environmental insults. So what I'm arguing is that we often think as physicians or doctors about gene environment interactions. What I'm saying is, is that actually you have to think about it as gene environment microbiome interactions. It's that fundamental. You talk about the evidence microbiome's role in it. That becomes much trickier, if I'm completely honest with you, Liz, because microbiome science is young. It's only been around for 20 years. Studying the microbiome is actually quite hard because... First of all, it's very difficult to access. And as soon as you look at it, you change it because many of these bacteria, for example, are anaerobic. They don't like oxygen and they certainly don't like colonoscopes. It's also a really complex interactome. It's like this really super complicated network. And trying to unpick that is really, really hard. What I've tried to do in this book, therefore, is try to bring strings of evidence from these different fields of research, shows from animal research, from population science, from prospective studies of the microbiome to build a body of evidence that says, look, you've got to take the microbiome seriously if we are really going to meaningfully reduce the incidence of these really crippling chronic diseases that so adversely affect people's health. And one of the treatments that I think is really interesting is when you transplant a healthy biome from one patient to another, which is called a faecal transplant. And that's actually done by using feces. Can you explain how that works? Sure. It's as gross as it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> Fecal transplantation is an ancient practice that's been done for thousands of years. There's a sort of old story that always gets wheeled out every time we talk about this, which is that Chinese medics 2,000 years ago give alarmingly known as yellow soup to patients with traveler's diarrhea to fix it. But within nature, we have good examples of coprophagia being performed by a large number of animals. This is when they eat their own feces. Correct. So lots of animals do it. And my favorite one is the panda bear. Panda bear mothers give feces to their young because they transfer E. coli, which helps them to metabolize cellulose found in bamboo. If a panda doesn't have a fecal transplant, it can't eat bamboo. So in the 1950s, fecal transplantation began to be experimented with as a treatment for hospital superbug infection called Clostridium difficile or the C. diff as it's sometimes known. And actually it was very effective. But again, it was sort of put in the drawer because maybe perhaps the physician community didn't really want to believe it was that effective. And then in the 2000s, there were a number of trials done in Holland where actually it was found to be very, very impactful. Now it's nice approved. And in the NHS, if you have patients with C. diff, you can now give that as a standard NHS treatment. But fecal transplantation, or as we like to call it, intestinal microbiota transplantation, or IMT, that sounds better. It does, doesn't it? It sounds a bit <laughs> more palatable. But microbiome science is beginning to give us really interesting insight in the potential power and role of this as a therapy for things which you would not typically associate fecal transplantation as being helpful for. For example, it seems to be a very important modifier of how immunotherapy works in the treatment of some cancers. It seems to be an important modifier for treating conditions like irritable bowel syndrome, for treating conditions like obesity or cardiovascular consequences of obesity. And it seems to have weird and wonderful side effects. So there's been a couple of case reports, for example, of patients receiving FNPs for a number of different reasons who have alopecia, the universalis, and their, and their hair is grown back. Why? So if you now look across the broader portfolio of clinical trials being done internationally, if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of FMT trials. Some of them are slightly perhaps questionable, looking at things like Tourette syndrome and various other kind of weird and wonderful conditions where you really wouldn't think there would be a therapeutic benefit. And others are really very important that we think will be very transformative. But on the other hand, we do know that neurological symptoms are too linked to the gut biome. So it's not impossible to think that Tourette's could be helped. No, and that's the kind of mind-boggling thing. You know, why would your gut 
be associated with both neurodevelopmental conditions of the brain or neurodegenerative conditions of the brain or how you think and feel. So whether you feel anxious or whether you feel depressed. And you mentioned autism at the top of this conversation. These things are really controversial. There's a a big body of scientists out there that feel very strongly that this is not a good avenue of scientific inquiry and that actually this is distracting us from the more important questions. Again, I'm sort of to a degree sympathetic from that because of course, mental health is a under-resourced and undervalued commodity within the healthcare sector in general. We all know that if you work and if you're listening to this and you work in primary healthcare, you'll know that better than anyone. You know, there are real world drivers of these things, which have got nothing to do with the microbiome. But what I am saying is that the microbiome unquestionably influences your susceptibility to these things. And what we have, and what I've tried to write about in this book, is the evidence to support the microbiome's critical role in brain development. And again, we've got really quite good evidence for this from these kind of different trial designs from animals through to prospective human cohorts through to epidemiological size population sets that suggest actually, if you disrupt your microbiome in early life, it has a very significant impact on brain development and those implications may be lifelong. So what's the process when you carry out a faecal transplant? What do you actually do? So that's a super interesting question. And the reason it's so interesting and the reason, one of the reasons why FMT studies is so hard to interpret, a lot of variation. So in practice, typically an FMT is treated like any other form of tissue donor. So that means the screening and recruitment of donors is quite a rigorous process. These patients have to conform to donating tissue in the same way that a kidney transplant patient would. So They go through quite a number of vetting uh, procedures and then screening procedures as we take their samples and try and make sure there are no pathogens within them that are going to cause harm. Then we have to process and prep the FMT. And again, there are different ways of doing that. So typically it's mixed with some saline, so it's kind of liquefied. And then it's either given through a nasogastric tube into the stomach, or sometimes it's given down a gastroscope, so an endoscope that goes down into the mouth, or it's given through a colonoscope, so up through the bottom into the colon, given with a syringe. There are more modern ways of doing that. So there are a number of companies in the world at the moment, both public and open companies and also commercial entities trying to make it slightly more palatable, literally. So you can now have capsules, frozen FMT samples, or as it's famously known as a crapsule, and you can take these things orally. The reason there is such variation, though, is because some of these donors are individual and unique donors. And some of these samples are pooled samples, so multiple patients giving samples together and then they're homogenized. And we try and give some quality assurance and standardization of the intervention. You know, some of these samples are freeze dried and you get a very particular component of the microbiome. Others are the whole microbiome and all of its content. And we also know that there's a lot of variance and variation in, in the host. So the person that's the recipient, the person that's getting given that FNT. So. What we don't have within the FNT community, perhaps at the moment, although we're starting to move towards this, is standardised models of giving these interventions, which means interpreting it is quite tricky. And I suppose another factor is that there are a major difference between men and women's gut biomes. Yeah, absolutely. But also old and young people or people of different ethnicities or people from different parts of the world. So the one thing that we have learned from microbiome science in the last 20 years is the inter-individual variation is absolutely massive. It outweighs absolutely everything. But also that variation exists both in the donor and the recipient. So there is this phenomenon that is sort of talked about of super donors. So there are some people's feces that is just incredibly efficacious and works incredibly well and others just don't work at all. And some of these super donors within trials, they become incredibly precious because they're standardized. But of course, they're not scalable because these poor people can only produce so much. So as a sort of therapeutic intervention for populations, it doesn't really scale very well unless you can pull and understand what's going on. It's not just the donor microbiome that determines efficacy or or side effects. It's also the, the recipient. And we know, and we're beginning to understand how you engineer or you can begin to engineer the recipient microbiome to ensure what is known as engraftment. So how these bugs culture within the gut and how they stay within the gut and have that health benefit. And then the final part, you've still got to create the environmental conditions for these microbes so they can produce all the good molecular components that are going to have the health benefit, which basically means you've got to feed them. 
There's been a couple of studies that have come out of Harvard recently looking at FNT for obesity and diabetes management. Hope, of course, was that we were going to simply be able to do what we had done in animals and transfer it into humans, and that just didn't work at all. But what they found is that, of course, if you feed the microbiome fibers, well, then once it's engrafted, begin to do what you want it to do. Going back, James, to the differences between men and women's biomes. Yeah. It seems that the interaction between the biomes and our bodies has ongoing effects on our sexual development. Correct. And you mentioned in male mice that don't have any contact with bacteria. They develop feminine traits, while female mice, born germ-free, become masculinized. What's the explanation for that? So if we go back to the sort of first large-scale studies of the microbiome, so there was a, a big project called the Human Microbiome Project, which is NIH-funded. One of the early questions they had was, what are the differences between men and women in terms of the microbiome? And the first thing to say is, is that the male and female microbiome differs at almost every level. So it's not just the gut that's different, it's the skin, it, it's the lung, it's everything. Those differences exist across all stages of life. The implications of that are important. Of course, there's a fundamental question, why are they different? And it might be that men and women, of course, have different social roles. They Perhaps we eat different things. Perhaps we go to work in different environments. But maybe that these things are an important part of that explanation. But also, there is a biological explanation as to why they're so different. Now, the, the short answer is, it's a bit disappointing, Liz, is that we're still working on how the answer to that question out. I don't think we have all the answers, but having said that, clearly there is a big part of the role the microbiome plays in changing the functions of androgens, uh, of hormones, particularly estrogen, progesterone, but also in testosterone. So it's as, as important in men as it is in, is in women in, in that regard. And again, the timing of these interactions seem to be very, very important. So the timing of the disruption of the microbiome seems to play a very important role in explaining some of the gender dimorphism we see in your risk of chronic disease later in life. And what we know from some big studies that have come out of China and also in Holland is that when that happens before puberty, which is why I brought that up at the beginning of this conversation, the implication seems to be very, very important and seems to have a long lasting effect. And we think it's through this access that we might be able to explain why we see conditions such as polycystic ovary syndrome and why we see conditions like endometriosis, which are also on the rise and are probably underreported in, in women. But it's also why we see this very strong link between obesity and something like PCOS, because there is a broader dysfunction in the microbiome that drives inflammation, which leads to the obese phenotype which in parallel affects how androgens function within the body. It's probably subtler than that, because we also see important differences in things like microglial functions, which are kind of macrophages that function within the nervous system, and various other components of the immune system. So there's definitely more than that going on. We just haven't really begun to fully understand it yet. And the fact that you see these very different male and female biomes, does that explain why women are more prone to chronic disease? That's a question I'm probably going to plead the fifth on. So, uh, so, so I or would might say, help, uh, perhaps. Yeah. So, I think what I would say is that I think both men and women are at high risk of chronic disease. But if you look at autoimmune diseases and various diseases like that, yeah. there's a disproportionate number of women who are affected. Yeah, that's a fair point, and I totally accept that. So, my hypothesis is that the microbiome is a key part of that explanation. I don't think it's everything, but I think it plays a very large part in it. And I think unless we understand that, we're not going to be able to fix that gender gap. Again, my hypothesis would also be if you want to understand why that exists, you've got to go right back to early life. You've got to go back to the assembly of the microbiome and you've got to go certainly, you know, before puberty to understand that relationship and why it's so important. And in fact, the way a man and woman's gut biome interact may even have an impact on their ability to reproduce. Yeah. So we have a global fertility crisis. Fertility is in both men and women is precipitously falling. This is a big problem and we need to understand why this is happening. We know that microbes play an important part in explaining infertility. All physicians on this call will know this. We know that pathogens are a big part of the infertility story. What we know less is how our symbionts, so how the mutualistic microbes that maintain the health of our sexual organs play a role in that story. What we do know is that we're seeing strong associations between changes, for example, in the vaginal microbiome and particularly populations of lactobacilli 
and risk of infertility. That's a kind of well-established marker. And we also know that men have a microbiome within sperm, although it's super, super low abundance. And by definition, it's transitory. By definition, it's going to be there for a long period of time. And we know that these microbiomes are changing and our hypothesis is that it plays an important part in the story. Is in fact, I think if you look at the sperm count drop between 73 and 2018 for men, it's over 50%. Yeah, it's really shocking. Because again, you have to look at the broader global changes in chronic disease risk. And what we know is we've got an obesity epidemic or pandemic, I should say. And that, I think, also plays an important part in explaining why this is happening. So it's not just the urogenital microbiome, it's the broader microbiome, it's the gut microbiome that explains that. And we know that the microbiome is very important because it changes the way bile acids are metabolized. And that has an important part in determining how our vitamins are absorbed that also play an important part in determining spermatic function. So vitamin A, for example. So there's a, there's a bigger piece here. And actually, the gut microbiome might be a very important part in determining that story. Well, you do mention some animal studies that have been able to reproduce dropping sperm count by feeding animals yeah. an unhealthy diet, and then using fecal transplants to basically bring yeah. the sperm counts back up again. Doesn't that, that blows my mind, by the way. I mean, obviously, that's animals, it's not humans. Correct. But still, as a model, yeah. that seems quite convincing. So it does, right? But it, but it comes back to what I was saying to you before, which is that FMT or fecal microbiota transplantation is a very, very useful experimental tool. It's very useful for validating or, or identifying mechanisms, but they don't necessarily always translate well into humans. And the reason that they no. don't is that the human microbiome is so much more complex. It's so much more diverse and it's so much more vulnerable to environmental uh, confounders and environmental drivers. And again, so one further caveat, we are starting to see FMT trials in, in humans in, in fertility. This is very early stage stuff with very small numbers of patients, certainly too early to draw any real inferences from. But I do remain optimistic about it. I do think that this offers an opportunity to people who really have very few other therapeutic options, and I'm, I'm quite excited about it. But it also tells us if you're listening to this and you've been struggling with this issue or you're thinking about having a family, actually, your diet is incredibly important. What you eat and the medicines that you take are incredibly important. Taking antibiotics unnecessarily can be very detrimental because these things determine both destruction, the function of the microbiome, and they can have really quite a big impact. And we think that these things are really underappreciated. Well, going back then to what we can all do to create a healthy biome right from the start, you're arguing that once pregnant, the maternal microbiome may be one of the most important factors in determining the future baby's health. Yeah, I sometimes struggle not to be too evangelical about this. You know, I'm a colorectal surgeon and I'm not a pediatrician and I'm not an obstetrician, right? So I fully acknowledge those two caveats. So I think there was a lot of excitement about 10 or 15 years ago, perhaps even more recently, actually that the gestating mother had a placental microbiome and that perhaps there were populations of microbiomes that had an evolutionary basis that were really important drivers for the developing infant and their future risk of disease. M many of those pieces of work have been discredited now or we've moved on from them because there were big problems with sampling errors and how those studies were, were performed. But what we are beginning to understand is how the maternal microbiome signals to the gestating infant and the different mechanisms it has at its disposal to do that. Now, this has to be considered in the context of other kind of various epidemiological studies, I suppose. And epidemiological theory that goes back, you know, many years, in, in reality, not actually that controversial because, you know, we've known for probably 40 or 50 years that environmental risk in pregnancy and in early life seems to have an important association with your risk of chronic immune state. Sure. We've known that basically smoking and alcohol is not a good thing. Exactly right. So that in itself is not particularly controversial. But there is this concept of orchestral signaling, which is a term used in the broader scientific literature. And what that basically says is that you should think of the microbiome as a chemical superhighway. It's like a giant fermenting engine in the maternal gut, and it's producing hundreds of thousands of different small molecules, which can quite happily cross the placenta and can cross into the, the gestating infant. We are beginning to understand that this orchestra plays different bits of a tune at different bits of the pregnancy, and it will wake up bits of the orchestra when it wants to play a particular bit of the song. And we also know that this song is changing with each generation. Changes in the microbiome caused by, for example, widespread adoption of antibiotics are actually passed from mother to baby. 
So the best example that we have of this is short-chain fatty acid signaling. So short-chain fatty acids are a well-established secondary metabolite of fiber metabolism by bugs and a particular metabolite called propionate crosses the placenta and actually it has a really important part to play in brain development, for example, but also in lots of other different signaling cascades. We know that the maternal microbiome influences the risk of obesity in the developing baby. We know that the maternal microbiome also influences the mother's risk of clinical complications of pregnancy, such as gestational diabetes, and that these mechanisms are quite similar from a microbial perspective as they are in obese individuals who are not pregnant. So these microbiome changes seem to be relatively, relatively consistent. So, so my personal view is that the maternal microbiome is incredibly precious and needs to be protected. And you think that today babies are developing a biome very different to their recent ancestors. Yeah. Which may indeed have lifelong consequences. Yeah, I think dramatically different. I think that change is speeding up, not slowing down. This all really goes back to the Second World War. And the reason I think it goes back to the Second World War, that was the time when we started to industrialize antibiotic use. That was for all of the right reasons. But we weren't just using antibiotics for treating pathogens in humans. We were using it as an antibiotic growth product in farm animals. And it was used to treat everything from mastitis in cows through to maintaining the health of, of our fish stock. And although we have good legislation now in Europe, though that that is illegal and it's illegal in other parts of the world, actually antibiotics are still widely used as part of animal husbandry practices across the world. And of course, not all countries have good antibiotic regulation in farming. I'm not saying these things to not farmers. They have a tough job. But the implications of the global misuse of antibiotics were really significant for a microbiome because it doesn't matter if you're not being prescribed them by your doctor, you're still being exposed to them absolutely every day. So I think that's been a really big driver and change in the microbiome. But do you think doctors need to be tougher? Because I know patients like to come out with prescription quite often when they go to see their yeah. GP. But if you haven't got evidence of a bacterial infection, antibiotics are sometimes given prophylactically. And surely that is something that needs to stop. So look, I mean, again, I'm a doctor and I prescribe antibiotics and I prescribe them prophylactically because I'm a surgeon. So every operation that I do, I give antibiotics. And every time I do it, I think, oh, gosh, am I doing the right thing? So hands up. That's a greater risk, though, isn't it? I mean, every time we take any medication, it's a risk benefit analysis. Of course. The benefit course. has to be greater than the risk. So if I go in and I'm feeling a bit run down and I've had a viral infection, say, for a couple of weeks. Yeah. Probably if I argue strongly enough, I can come away with some antibiotics. Yeah. So you can. and Which would not be a good thing, by the way. So what we do have is a national strategy. We've got a government strategy that says, look, strategically, as an NHS organization, we need to reduce our prescribing of antibiotics. And we absolutely prescribe too many antibiotics. I suppose what I'm trying to do with this, to try and change the narrative a little bit, by trying to explain the harm that is caused by prescribing those antibiotics unnecessarily, and, and also trying to give a sense of the scale of antibiotic prescribing and the, and the scale of antibiotic m misuse and particularly the implications for that misuse of antibiotics at particular moments in life. Really, from our research, we are doing research into, into neonates, the early development of the microbiome in neonates. What we know is that children have a very large exposure to antibiotics. Seven million antibiotic prescriptions are given each year in, in North America in emergency rooms. We have the average child in low and middle income countries is given around four to five prescriptions of antibiotics per year. We know that we give roughly about 38 billion daily doses of antibiotics globally. I mean, it's crazy how many we give. And what we know is that if you give those antibiotics that you can, depending on the antibiotic you give and the, obviously the duration and the dose that you give, that you can fundamentally alter the microbiome permanently in these people. And the implications for that are really potentially serious. We know from really quite good studies done in Finland and Scandinavia and other studies across the world that that meaningfully changes your risk of obesity, diabetes, asthma, allergy. And so I'm not saying don't prescribe antibiotics. I'm saying antibiotics are the most precious resource that we have. They're incredibly important drugs that are life-saving, but we should treat them as such. That's before we've even talked about the antimicrobial resistance crisis, which is a whole other conversation. And understand that if you give those antibiotics, there will be potentially long-term implications of that prescription. You won't ever see as a physician. They will turn up 10 or 20 years later. And of course, they'll be probably put down to other factors. 
So basically only give them when absolutely clinically necessary. I think so. Battle I have at the moment in my profession to give you some sense of the conversations that I'm having. So at the moment, there is a move towards something known as selective decontamination of the gut in patients having surgery, which means that when a patient is going to come in and have an operation on the bowel, we give them massive doses of neomycin and vancomycin. So we give them huge broad spectrum antibiotics. The risk of surgical site infection goes down. The risk of postoperative complication goes down. We just stop worrying about the long-term implications of that. We don't worry about antimicrobial resistance. And I'm having to have battles with my peers at the moment to say, look, I'm not sure that's a smart thing to do because Number one, you need those microbes to metabolize the drugs and medicines that you're going to give to your patients. And you're going to create massive variation in how those drugs are metabolized and the potential implications of that are unknown. Particularly, for example, if you're going to have chemotherapy, where we know that the microbiome has an important part to play. We think that that has very significant implications for long-term quality of life and gut function, because you need microbes for normal gut function. And if you don't have them, then that has important implications. So many of my patients come to my clinic and they will sit there going, I've got terrible abdominal pain and I don't understand why. I know why. But the problem is, is then retrospectively fixing that problem is really, really hard. We have 5 million people died from antimicrobial resistance associated conditions in 2019. I think it was 2019. There was a Lancet paper that came out in 2022. I, I think it was 2019, 2020. And this crisis is growing daily. There's not a huge amount of interest in the pharmaceutical industry in developing new antibiotics because they're drugs people take short term. Any antibiotics which are developed now will be the last line of use. So sure. it's not a profitable yeah. line. So I think that's another issue as well. If you look at the top 50 pharma companies, very few are actually investing even in this. Yeah. If you look at the most profitable drugs in the world right now at the moment, they're all immunotherapies. I've argued that antimicrobial resistance is a biomarker of social failure. Antimicrobial resistance is also, a, if you like, a biomarker of the destruction that we've done to our own microbiome. It tells you about the scale of the problem, which is enormous. But if we come back to the, the drug story, what we've also learned in the last few years is that many of the medicines that we take in our day-to-day -day lives for the management and, 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 if you like, the control of chronic diseases such as hyperlipidemia or hypertension actually change the microbiome. And they change the microbiome in ways that we don't really understand. We give, I think, about four and a half trillion doses of medicine globally every year, which means that basically somewhere in the globe, half the global's population are taking medicine every day. You can't do that at that sort of scale over these relatively short evolutionary timeframes and not expect there to be some impact on our internal ecology. And that has very significant implications for our patients because many of our elderly patients are multi-comorbid and they're experiencing polypharmacy. This is when people are taking a number of drugs at the same time. Yeah. Each day they will take a cocktail of medicines. And as doctors or pharmacists, we often think about drug interactions. So does drug A interfere with the safety of drug B, for example? And, and is that okay to give together? But actually, from a microbiome perspective, those concoctions of drugs will change the structure and function of the microbiome. And an individual's microbiome will deal with that polypharmacy in a very variable way. It is incompletely understood. I mean, you mentioned one recent study of a thousand drugs, which were tested against 40 gut microbes, and 25% yeah. of them inhibited a strain. Yeah, that was an in vitro study. But again, like if you take a bacterium, like Bacteroidetes theta iota omicron, those researchers just looked at that one strain of bacterium. And what they found is that actually it's got a very, very large number of enzymes that can metabolize a very large number of different drugs just within that one strain. And within the microbiome, what you've got is yeah. um, lots of different strains, and those strains vary considerably between individuals. Unless you have a measure and understanding of the microbiome, it's very difficult to prescribe safely and to understand the toxicity of those medicines. And the best example is paracetamol. Paracetamol, probably the world's most studied drug, probably the world's most widely used drug. I use it every day. But bacteria in the gut have quite an important role in determining its safety and, and its efficacy because they influence the way that sulfur is consumed in the gut. And sulfur is a very important part of how uh, we safely detoxify paracetamol in the liver. This is work done by a guy called Jeremy Nicholson and his group at Imperial. You can predict that how safe paracetamol is going to be based on an individual's microbiome and functions. Yet in clinical practice, we have absolutely no measure of it. We don't even con conceptualize it. 
And equally, we're very bad, and I say this, including myself in that, in giving patients nutrition and dietary advice to support their taking of these medicines to ensure that, that they're adequately metabolized. Yes, we say take it after food or take it before food because we know that, you know, that might influence its safety within the foregut, but we're not really thinking about its safety metabolism more broadly. James, you mentioned at the start of our conversation that damage to the biome in the early stages of life tends to be particularly important. Yeah. Is that because it's at that point that the body is starting to evolve its full biome? Broadly, the microbiome is seeded during delivery through the birth canal. And then as soon as you start to breastfeed, there's a sort of super bloom of bifidobacteria in the gut that break down some of these lovely sugars that exist within breast milk. And then as the baby starts to explore the world, it goes through a bit more progression and then it will start to eat, it will develop teeth, and then the microbiome becomes much, much more diverse as it adapts to the different types of food that it has. But roughly by the age of three to five, we think the microbiome has an adult construct in terms of its diversity and its terms of its sort of ecological structure. Now, the functions of those microbes, so what those microbes are doing and how they're interacting with the world will continue to evolve. But basically, the ecology is kind of set. And therefore, we think that if you do something to damage that assembly in early life or to perturb it in some way, we think that that will have really major long-term implications for the healthy development of that baby. And that comes back down to this more controversial idea of autism spectrum conditions. So typically they present, not always, of course, there are always exceptions to all of this, but they typically present three to five when we think the microbiome is assembled and that early phase of brain development has occurred. And that's led some researchers to question whether or not disturbing the construction of the microbiome in early life is causally associated with the development of these sorts of problems. Because those children appear to have a less diverse gut biome, which may be an association, not causative, but it's there. Yeah, but it might be. If you go back to the very earliest case reports of autism in the 1940s, those children often presented with gastrointestinal dysfunction or eating problems. And we see that in, in kids today. And again, the debate is, is that a cause and an effect? There was a study done in Pingu in China where they looked at a cohort of around, I think it was 700 neurotypical and diverse children. And when they accounted for nutritional and dietary variables, actually there were still strong microbial associations. We've got other animal studies where we were talking about fecal transplantation earlier. You can bring out specific autistic types of behaviors in animals by doing fecal transplantation from children with autism into those animals. So some of those behaviors are transferable. They're not genetically determined. They are transferable, which again, sort of blows my mind a bit. Now, you've identified four ages that our biomes go through. Yeah. Can you explain the stages? The first stage is the maternal microbiome. So actually, it's kind of the gestational microbiome. The second stage is three to five. The third stage is really quite long and it's relatively stable and it goes from five to somewhere in our 60s to 70s. We don't quite know when this tipping point occurs and it's variable for different people. At around 60 to 70, it starts to change again. So it becomes less stable. It goes through another period of deterioration until we pass away, until we die. Actually, there's a fifth stage, which is the necrobiome. So when you die, of course, all those microbes within you, they keep working, they keep functioning. Those anaerobes have got work to do. But what we think is, is that you can map specific disease risks onto those different stages. Now, just sort of to slightly overcomplicate things a little bit, and, and, and I hope you'll forgive me this one digression in, into quasi-science. The way I think about the progression of that line in a sort of philosophical way is that everybody's line is just different your microbial evolution will just be different to mine. And part of that's because you're a woman and I'm a man. Part of it's because you live in a different part of the world to me. Part of it because I've had my appendix removed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, again, it might well have saved your life. It might have done, yeah, yeah. Right. So look, what I'm saying is, is that the microbiome kind of fluctuates. I imagine it existing in a kind of quantum state and it constantly resonates and changes with the daily environment that we have to deal with, the cycle of our hormonal rhythms perhaps our sleep weight cycles, perhaps the work that we do and the jobs that we're in, it's constantly changing its function to adapt and to support our health and our wellness. And the problem comes when you take massive doses or recurrent doses of antibiotics, or you move to a completely different city, or you encounter a major environmental driver of the microbiome. So perhaps you're exposed to some pollutants, and that whole line shifts. And then the gene 
environment microbiome interaction shifts and therefore your disease susceptibility shifts. So the microbiome is really, really important. Genes are important, environment's important, but it's just this kind of bit of the engine, if you like, that explains chronic disease risk or non-communicable disease risk that we haven't really fully appreciated in building our models of disease risk uh, historically. So the final stage of the gut biome, at least while we're alive, kicks off between sort of 60 and 70. Yeah. So that's actually happening later than in most of our body, because we tend to think of our body aging prior to that. So there's this concept of the mosaic of aging. So different bits of our body all age at different rates. And of course, there's chronological aging and biological aging, which are two different constructs. There is this increasingly accepted idea of inflammation. aging. So actually... Many of our aging biological processes are determined by our exposure to pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory environmental agents. And the immune system of the gut kind of slows as we get a bit older. So you get this process of immunosenescence as it all kind of slows down. Part of the microbiome world at the moment is trying to understand the role that microbes have in that relationship and whether or not you can engineer it in some way to kind of modify it. And some microbiome science has been done looking at populations who age particularly well and live particularly long lives. So you can look at centenarians, so people that live over the age of 100, for example, and study their microbes and compare them to people that are either younger or have more frailty associated with the process of aging. And what you see is distinct differences. So for example, you see distinct differences in microbes that break down and, and co-metabolize bile. Bile is a really important mediator of our immune systems, and it has lots of other important secondary functions. But again, you then come back down to the old and favorite cause and effect question. Is this a product of the fact they've just been able to live that long, or is there something that's really explaining their old age? Again, we've got other animal models where we can actually go and modify an animal's uh, resistance to the aging process through fecal transplantation. So there is some experimental evidence that microbes seem to be important in defining our risk of having complications from the aging process. The precise mechanisms through which that happens, of course, is kind of complicated. Not only do our biomes change as we get older, it seems it's harder to alter them. Yeah, I think that's true. It doesn't mean they can't be altered and it doesn't mean that you can't do something about it, but it's much easier to set the microbiome up for success when it's pliable, when it's got that moment where actually it's still making up its mind as to what it's going to be. One of the big problems that I have and that I constantly come back to in microbiome science is this word dysbiosis. What dysbiosis means is an abnormal microbiome associated with a disease state. Typically, people say there's been a loss of diversity in the microbiome, and that's associated with disease. And I've got a problem with that because I don't really know what that individual's microbiome was before the disease came along and when that microbiome changed. So basically, somebody with MS has a different gut biome. Yeah. Has the MS caused that gut biome to be different? Yeah. Or was the gut biome different to begin with? Exactly right. But I think one of the kind of major definitions of a healthy microbiome for me is this idea of if its resilience and its plasticity. So its ability to maintain its structure and function in the face of an antibiotic dose, for example, a penicillin, or its ability to adapt and flex to the daily stresses of life. And I think if you disrupt the microbiome in that kind of early phase in life, you lose those two important traits, like it just becomes a lot less resilient. And that's why we think that some patients are then particularly at risk of things like bowel cancer. So within my field, I'm kind of worried because young people's millennial populations have a risk of bowel cancer that's four times that someone born in the 1950s and 60s. And we don't know why. And so what we think is happening is that there are multiple hits. There's a hit in the assembly of the microbiome. And then what happens is, is that that microbiome is less resilient. You then expose that gut to a poor Western diet, all the things that you know, smoking, you know, sedentary lifestyle, and then, of course, that promotes inflammation. And then at some point, that change in, in bowel cancer. That's why I'm sort of evangelical about the maternal microbiome. Unless you set out the development of the emerging immune system properly and then protect the assembly of the microbiome in early life, you can't really ensure, assuming all the other social variables that happen that we have no control of, that people are going to have the best chance of a healthy life without chronic disease. And of course, it's people who are most socially disadvantaged, who are going to be most badly hit by cost of living crisis, who are most vulnerable to this. And we don't have effective policy or healthcare regulation that protects them. 
the microbiome is a different way of explaining to people why having a healthy diet, why exercising is so important and why the sort of Western diet that is advertised and constantly marketed to our children is just so damaging. And finally, James, your thesis is that modern medicine completely underplays the value of the microbiome. And actually, medical care is much more individual than we've ever thought. Now, the gold standard for testing new drugs is the randomized control trial. One group of people takes exactly the same medication. The other group takes different medication, whether that's placebo or different medication. Yeah. Well, if your thesis is correct, and we all have this incredibly individual response, are those drug trials actually giving us the data that we need? So the answer is no. They're absolutely not giving you the data that you need. The, the reason the microbiome is so important, because it implies that the whole basis of all drug development is flawed. It doesn't work. And there have been a couple of really nice studies that have brilliantly described this. And I talk about one, which was a 2015 study published in Science, looking at the development of immunotherapy. It was looking at this particular class of drug called checkpoint inhibitors. And they took two genetically identical animals from different laboratories and gave them the drug in the sort of trial design that you've just described. And the two animals had completely different responses. And the reason that they had different responses is because mice are coprophagic. So if you put animals in a cage, they share they share their microbiomes. These animals from different laboratories had completely different microbiomes. And it was the microbiome that explained the variation in the drug. And in fact, in this quite interesting series of experiments, they were able to identify an individual species of bug, which is a species of bifidobacteria. And then once they then compared the individual species of bacteria against the drug, the bacteria was as efficacious as the immunotherapy. So yeah, I'm absolutely saying that. And I appreciate that's controversial. I'm also acknowledging that there are some drugs that don't work through the microbiome and their mechanism will not be related to or be dependent on bacterial metabolism. But because the microbiome has such an important indirect effect on the function of our innate immune system or adaptive immune system, and because it influences our metabolism in so many other unexplored and important ways, and because it's such a critical explanation of why we have inter individual variation in our response to drugs, Unless you understand it, you can't really create safe drugs. There are major implications for future care, if you're right. Yeah, huge. And you're right. The problem is, is that we don't have a good way of measuring it in clinical practice. If you're the average doctor and you do a microbiome sequencing test, it's a nightmare to interpret. We don't really know what it means. Our patients don't know what it means. My clinic is full of patients with endless microbiome consumer tests going, what does this mean? I don't know, because so many of these studies are done without that mechanistic piece. We haven't really invested in microbiome science properly yet. It's really in its infancies. There's been a lot of hype about it. There's a lot of companies out there telling you that they're going to change the world with it. It's a young science, so we need to give it a little bit more time. Well, so interesting. Thanks so much, James, for talking today. Oh, listen, it's been absolutely my pleasure. So thank you so much for having me. Bye. Bye. Hope you enjoyed the latest episode of the podcast. And a reminder, you can follow me on Twitter at Liz C. Tucker, and sign up to the podcast mailing list at whatyourgpdoesnttellyou.com. Many thanks for listening. Bye for now.